Welcome to part two of our conversation about the May Stringer House with Christian Paul. Has anyone ever been able to to put more of an identity to Gary? Has anyone ever been able to, to pinpoint where did this chest come from that was donated to this museum and and then trace it back any further than just when it went, went through the doors uh, into, into the May Stringer House? You know, Tony, I am not aware of any backstory like that. I'm not saying it hasn't been done. Because I I don't know. Mm -hmm. I definitely plan on going back one of these days and doing it again. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Valid question. Yeah. For sure. It sounds like I wanted to tell you about the final uh, DR60 session. Okay. I had up there. Now, this is on my second uh, investigation there. And this was all while that thunderstorm was going on. Mm hmm. So even on even on my recorders, you hear the booms and the bangs and the rain. You're 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 in a you're in an attic with a predominantly tin roof, and it's raining like hell. So there is a certain uh, noise level. Sure. <laughs> okay, you can kind of picture that. And at the end of the session, and I, I and I may have mentioned this before, when I end sessions. I always ask questions like, is there something I can do for you? Do you have a final word? Something you want to get out? And the answer was very surprising. What was that? The answer was, do you love me? Very odd. Very odd. Now, you know, as I'm, you know, you're, uh, Tony, I'm laying my notes out. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, this spirit reportably does not like women. Is this a thing of sexual preference and does it carry over? Mm -hmm. I surely don't know, but it's just something to make you go, hmm. I have, yeah. PP, you know, I have never had, do you love me ever? No, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, I, I understand where, where you'd question that area of it. It also makes me wonder though, a little bit about uh, a, the, the confusion that a spirit may have on the other side. And the only reference point I can make to try and understand that would be being in a dream uh, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but in that dream state, everything seems to make sense. You, I, I've had dreams where I'm almost like a different identity or I'm living in a different, a different life, but I'm still me and I'm, I'm seeing these things. And, and I have this whole backstory and knowledge of people, places, and things that I, I shouldn't have because I've never lived this life, but it's just all there. And you wake up from it and you're like, what the hell was that? And, 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 but for the, that fleeting time, it all makes sense. And it makes me wonder if, if spirits sometimes are like that, but in a permanent state where they're almost stuck in a place in a time where maybe that, that chest is still filled with goods and it, it's all of their things that are right there. Maybe there is a, a relationship going on there, whether, whether who it's with, uh, I don't know. But maybe just the, the fact that there's an, a body moving around that room would would trigger them because maybe they're in a heightened state or in an agitated or, or paranoid or anxiety state wondering, uh, you know, do you love me? Mistaking you or a human's presence for their loved one that maybe they were at odds with at the time or, or something of that nature. But everything is so foggy and so kind of out there that the questions you hear or the responses you're getting don't really correlate to, to current time, but it's still very much in their time. Very much in their time. And it's an intelligent response. Yeah. Yeah. All of the, uh, the EVPs that I have got in today's presentation, these were all intelligent responses. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, none, none of them were uh, kind of a, a residual 
thing because everything was either an answer to a question or to a pertinent comment from a statement. And I'm going to give you an example of that right now. As I finish that final session with Gary that night in the the, uh, thunderstorm, I go out of the attic. Now, when you walk out of the attic, there is a little, uh, for lack of a word, uh, like a foyer where the steps come up to a landing and there's artifacts on the wall and there's a couple of glass cases with different things that were donated. And this room is maybe... I'm going to get corrected when I give a dimension on this, Tony. I just know it, but (laughs) maybe, you know, eight by eight, eight by 10, you know, not a really big space, but enough to put a couple of cabinets and hang things on the wall for people to look at when they're on the museum tour. So, okay. I'm, I'm walking out of the attic. I had just finished my session with Gary And I talk to myself quite a bit, actually. But as I'm walking out, I'm talking about shutting down a certain recorder. And I get a woman's voice that says, yeah, you can. So it was like a direct response of me talking about shutting this recorder down. And this woman's telling me, yeah, you can. Giving you permission. Yes. And class A, clear as a bell. Yeah. Not one, not, not, a, not an EVP where you well, play that again so I can hear it. No. Mm-hmm. One, one, one shot deal, Tony. You hear it. What are your thoughts on on because it sounds like there are, are many spirits that seem to reside here and intelligent ones at that, not just oh yes residual. Uh, what's your take on uh, how many being from the property originally as being previous residents and and how many just kind of ended up there because of the sheer amount of local relics that are now lining the halls of the May Stringer House? Well, you have to figure. I'm sure Rick was an add-on. I don't know if he came with a piece of furniture or if he came with a tombstone or or maybe did he did he work in the area? Mm-hmm. Gary, he came with the chest. He didn't come with the house. Sure. You know, but now, I mean, we can talk about Jesse May who was definitely a resident of the house yeah, and was one of the original residents to the house. What sort of uh, encounters has happened with Jesse May? Jesse May was, uh, it was what I had was very brief, but you know, I'd rather have something brief. That's just really, really good. Then something that lasts for an hour and it's, I got to really work to figure out what spirit's telling me. Sure. You know, as you go down the steps from the attic and you're on the second floor of the house, you come down to a hallway. Now across this hallway, there's, there'd be a doorway to the right ahead of you and a doorway to the left. The doorway to the right toward the front of the house, that's Jesse May's room. And there is a doorway to the left, and that would have been John May and Marina's, and also Marina and Frank Saxon's master bedroom. Mm -hmm. I was in Jesse May's room, and... I'm in the room, I'm looking around, and they've, they've got the, the donations that they've got set up in this room really help to make this a little girl's room. Okay, the, the donations that they've got, they were smart enough, or the museum board, I, I guess, was smart enough to keep certain artifacts with certain other artifacts. And in this case, Jesse May's room, that's where all the little girl artifacts are. Okay. 
tell you about <laughs> the response we had in there. I, I'm in Jesse May's room, and I ask, Jesse May, are you here with us? Disembodied voice caught on one camera and two recorders. Hmm. Yes. How often does that happen where you, not you catch often. an EVP on multiple devices simultaneously? Not often. And to be able to catch, remember, this is disembodied voice. Technically, this is not an EVP. Yeah. This is a different d- disembodied voice. I audibly heard the voice. Okay. But it was also captured on the equipment. Yeah. What, it, what What's your reaction when you when you get something that clear? And and it's not you know you're not in another room and you're sitting there with a diet coke reviewing the tape. You're there hearing it in real time. In real time. Yeah. In real time. I, at 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 that stage, Tony, I'm the type of person. I feel connected. I feel I can get more. Okay. Because well, somebody tried to connect with me. I mean, obviously they're here. Yeah. Because they, at least I assume they're here because they said, yes. You're making a connection. You're I'll making be- a connection. But the other question is a three-year-old girl. I don't know how, how shy she would be. Mm-hmm. To a big guy walking around in in her house looking at her stuff, yeah, you know, because I mean, kids, you know, they get a little shy sometimes. You know, if you know your your buddy comes over to your house and your your little daughter has never met him before, they can be kind of put offish a little bit at times. That you know, I've seen it. It, it makes know. makes me. It, it, you've seen it with your own kids. It's a question that I wonder about with with spirits when we talk about age. Uh, because I mean, there, there's many, you go down that road and, and ask 50 different questions, but specifically on this one is a, a child who, yes, was three years old, uh, at their passing, but in, in today's terms would be more than a hundred years old, uh, and certainly wouldn't be alive even had they not passed at three. Do children who have passed at a young age, do they mature on the other side? Maybe their bodies don't even mature, uh, uh, but do they mentally mature to to gain more knowledge and, and more understanding of the world around them uh, as they, they watch it go and grow? Do, do they continue to grow mentally is what I wonder. You know, Tony, if I knew the answer to that... I'd write one heck of a book. <laughs> it, it's a, a just one of the gazillion questions. You know, you end up with it's more, a valid you know, question. More questions and, than answers. You know, will we ever know the answer? You know, yeah. that's that's the bigger question. It, it's it's one where I, I'm sure you could find some cases and studies where people have said, well, you know, based on what we've seen, it seems like this person, you know, uh, is at a different level than they would have likely been when they were alive. And you could find others where it's like, no, they still had the maturity of a four year old and they died when they were four. And that was 84 years ago. So it, it'll, it'll be obviously very contradictory, probably from case to case, just leading everyone again with more questions than answers. Than answers. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, but, you know, the thing of it is with Jesse May, Marina's room, her mother, Marina's room is right next door. Mm-hmm. Now, as I walked out of Jesse's room into the hallway, I'm trying to readjust some things on my uh, recorder and I'm, you know, and I'm looking at my recorder, but I'm looking at it through, uh, through night shot. And there's a lot of things on recorders. You cannot read in night shot. That's, that's just the way, that's just the way it is. Yeah. So I'm looking at my, at my recorder and I'm thinking, Jesse May for talking with me and I'm walking out, looking out at the recorder. I'm out in a hallway checking this recorder and a woman's voice goes, thank you, sir. (laughs) 
I have to assume that was Marina because Marina's room is right next door. Mm -hmm. And the yes I got was definitely a, a child sounding voice. Yeah. As where the thank you, sir. That was more of a, uh, an adult woman's voice. Yeah. You know, as we go into uh, Marina's room, I, I started doing uh, some session in there. Marina's room right now, I'm going to take a little little sidebar here. Marina's room right now is, uh, people call it the, the telephone room. Because there's all this old antique phone equipment in there. From phones to a phone booth to actually a couple of small uh, switchboard consoles. Mm -hmm. So if anybody would be attached to that, you know, possibly maybe something came in with that. Maybe that's not Marina. Sure. How are we going to know? So we're in there. We're we're, we're looking at all the stuff. So I sat down on one of the chairs in front of one of the, uh, the phone consoles and I ask, who's in here with me in the telephone room? And I get just as clear as day, I am. And it sounds like the same voice that did the thank you, sir. Almost assuming that you would know that that's, that's who it is. When you say I am, it's, you know, it, there's an su- su- assumption of identity there. Yes. Yeah. So I, I I would have to make my calculated guess that that is uh, Marina's area of the house. So I, I have to guess that Marina was uh, conversing with us. It's a very fascinating house. We're, we're, it, it, we're, it, it, we're it's it's off, it's off the hook. Yeah. Tony. It's very. I, I, Okay. Go, ahead. go ahead. You're saying you, you want to go back there again. And, and I guess I'm going to ask the question in closing because we're starting to run out of time, but would be, and when you go back there again, what, what are some questions that you have about the house that you want to have answered in your next investigation? Well, I definitely want to work with Fraser a little more. And if we have enough time, we can get into Fraser. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about Frazier in closing. Okay, we'll talk about Frazier in closing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move some of these other notes over here that we didn't get to. But uh, let's talk about Frazier. Let's uh, talk about Frazier. The I'm, man's name was Frazier Mountain. Okay, I was gonna say I'm listening. <laughs> Frazier Mountain was a major contributor to the museum. Mm-hmm. Fraser was very active on the museum board and Fraser Mountain donated many things in the military room. Now, the military room that used to be the room toward the back of the house where they had all the military artifacts, they changed it around to another smaller room off the kitchen and they're going to change the old military room into like a guest place where you can uh, I don't know, buy your coffee cup, your t-shirt, your Sure, like a gift shop. Like magnet, you know, yeah, the tchotchke kind of tourist kind of sure. stuff. Yep. Well, when I was in there, there is a lot of stuff in the military room that was Frasier's, or that was uh, was Frasier's, but it wasn't his stuff. It was from his son Dwayne Fraser Mountain, who was known as Rocky Mountain. Okay, so I was getting EVPs in the area, and I thought for some reason that all of Rocky's stuff was in this room and a little write up on him with his picture and all this. Well, I thought, well, maybe. Rocky was inhabiting this room attached to his old uniform. Sure. But it is Rocky was out in the military, decorated veteran, 
He came back home and then died of a heart attack here. But Fraser was still alive at this point. Okay. Okay. Rocky was a model train fan. And seeing that I'm a Lionel collector myself, we had kind of a kindred thing going on. There sure. First. And I asked, what kind of trains do you like? Mm-hmm. The response was Rocky. Oh, come on. Clear response. And I'm thinking, well, that couldn't have been Rocky. Yeah. I don't know if Rocky would say Rocky. Oh, come on. Sure. Didn't make sense to me. So through a process of uh, elimination from being there twice, it hit me. I think this is Fraser Mountain. Okay. So I go back later into the room and now I'm just, I'm talking to Fraser Mountain directly. Uh, like I said before, Fraser had decorated quite a few things in this house. He decorated all these war artifacts. There are no guns in there, but there are uniforms going from like Civil War era all the way up to Vietnam era. Okay. And at one point, I asked Fraser what his favorite artifact in the room was. What response did you get? The gun. The gun. And I asked three different times and always got the same answer and always got an answer. What there was in there was there was like a gun carved out of wood that they would use to train like young recruits. So it wasn't a working firing gun. It was just a sure piece of wood carved to look like a, a gun. gun. Yeah. And the big thing that Fraser likes is the gun. gun. Now, interestingly enough, as I ended the session that I was doing in there, my last session, okay, here, this this may be getting a little old, but here we go. I'm in this room and I asked, is there anything I can do for you? You know what the answer was? What? Bite me. <laughs> Honest to God, fight me. But I don't know if it was the same voice that I got from Fraser. When when did uh when did this Fraser uh individual pass? I mean, this was more of a current day thing being a Oh yeah, this is more of a, a current day. Yeah. Uh, Bonnie had told me at one time, I I couldn't say exactly, but it was not that long ago. So the term bite me, I mean, being a slang term or insult like that would have been, you know, popular. I mean, it was popular in the 90s. Uh, So I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be kind of a, a present day spirit to say bite me. Yes, you would. And that that's very curious and interesting that that is the response that you got. Because it's certainly we, nothing that, uh, you know, the originals would have said, Gary or anybody like that. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't. Yeah, that, that was not a term no. way back. They've yeah. been like, why would I bite you, sir? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah, bite me. Wow. When I listened to it, I was like... Son of a bitch. (laughs) Bite me. Yeah, really. We got we got time for a couple more. Uh, We're almost out. of. actually we are about out of time because it is uh, about two fifty six and I have another one coming up here at three. So I got to wrap it up. Okay, let me give you one more. I'll I'll do it quick. Okay, sure. I'm out of your hair, Tony. Sure. There was a time when I'm walking in to the old military room. This is the room that they converted the one that they were working to convert into like the gift shop. Yeah, okay. 
I'm walking in there. I've got a GoPro going. I've got my Zoom H1 recorder going. I'm just walking in, taking shots, walking around. I re- review the evidence later. Now, let's sidebar this for just, just a brief moment. You remember how Tony Soprano sounded on The Sopranos? Yes. Okay. Most people do. Most people were a fan of the show. I'm walking in the room, and in Tony Soprano's voice, I get, you're a sissy. (laughs) Clear as a bell. Yeah. Now, this did not sound like Frazier's voice. So, I cannot put a label on... Whose voice it was? You have to assume it's all, it, it's someone else. That's I assume it's someone else, but you're a sissy. Imagine Tony Soprano's voice. Tony talking to uh, you know Christopher or something, and yeah, you're a sissy. Just another layer of the spirits that reside in the May Stringer house. That wraps up part two of our conversation about the May Stringer House with Christian Paul. A big thank you to him for sharing his experiences with us today on the program. And a thank you to you for supporting the show and keeping us on the air. Without your support, we would not exist. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.